don't do an Irish book autobiographical about your humor without giving a nod to the people that gave you your sense of humor. So this book um, has many characters in it from my family, and this one includes a story from my grandmother, and it's called Playing Ketchup with Granny. Although I was born in Jersey City, there's something about the fork in the road of the N-17 on the way to my grandmother's house in Ballyglunan, near Athen Rye, that tells me I've arrived home. Accompany me on this. You're loath to buy into reincarnation, but there's an undeniable sense of silent company walking with you down a hill on the thin tongue of blacktop between Uncle Maddie's house and your grandmother's place next door. The hills that your grandfather worked and so suddenly died upon are a green patchwork with cobblestone fences dividing the fields from our neighbors. You can hear the soft murmur of the livestock braying at either side of you and lambs calling out for their mothers as the dust settles. A rickety car makes its way towards you, and a man you do not know waves his hand in greeting anyway. That's the kind of people that live here. The smell of the bog belches out of the chimney in soft black puffs, telling you that Granny Farraher has lit the turf fire and it's time for dinner. You walk in, and there's a weathered table on your right. There is butter and crumbs from the morning's bread where herself would have sat, her hawkish blue eyes devouring the contents of the newspaper that lies folded near the mug of tea. Sensing you're judging the dirty dish, she calls for you to come into the parlor. She is there, her hair an impossible shade of brownish red that is pulled back into a hard bun. She tried going to her natural color once, and when she saw pictures of the gray hair at 87, she exclaimed, Jesus, who's that old woman staring me in the face, before quickly dying it again. Her thin frame is perpetually in motion, contained within a thick blue apron of a dress that she wears regardless of the weather. She smokes half of an unfiltered cigarette, the other part of the fag, where the filter on the top drawer, because it's her way of only smoking half of what she used to. With a knowing glance here, and an eyebrow over there, she directs the ants in putting out the big spread without ever saying a word. Irish ham, cold cuts, and cheeses are rolled up into tight logs, fanned out onto the plate like spokes on a wheel. In the center of each dish is a perfectly symmetrical tomato and yellow potato salad, homemade of course. Mugs of tea and high glasses of orange soda are never allowed to go below half full thanks to the, worth, the wordless nods of the head of herself. Tell me about your life in America, she would say, her bony hand taking yours as the intense eyes are magnified through thick smudge bifocals. You prattle on about your good grades at school, the minor victories you had at sports, and the great essays you've written in English class. Well, he's good-looking and modest, she would say through pursed lips. It's not until later that you realize her sharp tongue and intellect have dissected you and put those boastful ways in their place. Do you have everything you need, pet? she'd ask, proudly surveying the spread that's been put before you. I didn't see any ketchup, Granny. Do you have any lying around? An eyebrow is raised, a head is tilted, and the uncle's wife is dispatched to make the five-mile ride into Chum. Well, God blast you, she'd say, half laughing. Sure, the Lord Jesus Christ would cook the supper with his own two hands, and this yank had asked for the ketchup. The ketchup would be there at every meal from now on, even if it was toast being served, just to prove that you'll never catch her flat-footed again. The suitcase is packed, the tears are shed, and a few hundred Irish pounds are crumpled and placed in your palm. You smooth them out into the back seat on the way to the airport, and you soon realize that there is equivalent of your father's weekly wage in your hand. The most valuable gift, however, is revealed when you open your suitcase and find a one-liter bottle of candy, great value, family-packed tomato ketchup as a memento of your dinner. There's a note taped to the bottle. Now, if you're without ketchup, tis your own fault. From that point forward until the woman's death, you will bring her a bottle of Heinz as a souvenir from America. She will shrug, shake her head, lift her eyes to the heavens, and laugh with a rattle cough before stabbing her turf fire with a spike. You lean into her hospital bed to give her a kiss for the last time. Her lungs at this point are filling up by the second. The woman next to her is wailing out to no one in particular, lost in her own madness. Your grandmother bristles for a second and between labored breaths says, Sure, I wouldn't be here at all if I had her lung power. 
When you open up your suitcase in your bedroom after making the trip home from her house, you will find packets of ketchup in your shirt collar, pants pocket, and medicine bag. You will take that liter ketchup bottle into every apartment or house that you will call home from now on. The red container producing a smile each time you look at it. It makes you think back on the life of an amazing woman and provides a past connection to your own sly sense of humor and the obsession with always getting the last word, which in this Irish woman's case translates into remember me.